Hey everyone, I'm Steve from GamersNexus.net and we're on episode 10 of Ask GN. So thank you for your continued questions in the comments. As always, questions below in the comments section if you want something included in the next video. Going forward, I am only reading questions in these comments sections for inclusion in Ask GN. I'm still reading all the other comments as allowed by time and things like that, but this is where I'm checking for questions in the future. So we are on episode 10, we made it to double digits. And for this episode, we're doing all overclocking questions. I, th I think there's maybe one that's not necessarily overclocking, but they're basically all overclocking. So we've got a bit of a theme here. The first question for this week's episode comes from Lord Inquisitor, who says, I have a question about a certain motherboard feature. I have a 5820K in the BIOS. It says I can choose between three options, like 3.6, 3.9, and 4.2 gigahertz. And I know it's a pre-overclock feature, but is it good if I choose 4.2 and leave it there? So this question is pertaining to or addressing the existence of instant overclock and easy overclock features. A lot of motherboards have these now. Some of them have a physical button on the board itself. So you can just normally next to the power button on MSI and I think it's Gigabyte also has them. A couple other manufacturers might have them. There's a button, you push it and it instantly checks your CPU SKU. It checks a table, frequency versus voltage, and then it applies that setting, depending on how aggressive the overclock is that you are seeking. So the thing with these solutions, and you can do it through BIOS or UEFI as well by just choosing overclock and it'll do it. The thing with these solutions is they are very one size fits all. So you lose a lot of the fine tuning and that can be a, a problem for the longevity of the CPU. And to sort of explain why it's important to understand how overclocking works at a top level. So the very basics of it, you have a few things on a CPU. You have the frequency. So in this case, maybe say it's 3.6 gigahertz stock. Let's just make that number up. 3.6 gigahertz stock CPU. You have multipliers for, at least for Intel and AMD as well. You, there's different overclocking settings for each manufacturer, each motherboard, but you have the frequency and the multipliers. The multiplier times the base clock derives the frequency. So if you have a base clock of 100 megahertz, which is what most Intel CPUs are, AMD is a bit different, but say you have a 100 megahertz base clock and then you have a 36 multiplier. So 100 times 36 is 3.6 gigahertz in this instance. So that's how you get your frequency. That is what that is derived from. And then the stability is a result of your voltage setting. So as the frequency increases, your CPU is increasing in how many times it oscillates per second. So this is measured in the billions of oscillations or cycles per second. And that number as it grows, as you increase the multiplier or the base clock, it will make the CPU become volatile. So it's less stable. To improve stability, you need to send more voltage to the CPU or more power generally. So as you increase the voltage, you'll see that a couple of things change. One, it gets hotter. Uh, two, it should get more stable. And three, over a long period of time, depending on what the voltage is, it can actually decrease the lifespan of the, the CPU or the GPU. So here's the thing though, a lot of the time the detriment to the lifespan is not going to be that noticeable unless you're sort of an extreme overclocker. If you're going crazy with it, yeah, you're gonna kill your CPU a lot faster, but for a moderate overclock, you're probably gonna replace the system before the usable life of the, the CPU expires anyway. So with that understood, answering the question directly, uh, it, it's not bad, I guess, to set a pre-overclock. I would recommend against it. My advice would be to just take the time. It normally doesn't take that long. Maybe set aside an hour and just play with the overclock and try and figure it out. So you want to start by looking for guides. And this is one of the other questions a bit further down. Uh, but you look for guides online. We've written a few. Overclock.net is fantastic and has really good guides that I reference a lot of the time as well. So you look for a guide, but generally you're going to just increase the multiplier and then see how the CPU responds. As you start hitting instability, you increase the voltage and just try not to go over a certain voltage depending on what the CPU is. Normally 1.3 to 1.4 volts on Intel is kind of my max. I don't like going higher than that, uh, but they're, it's different for every CPU and AMD especially is different. So hopefully that helps there. To very briefly sum it up, I would say just, just do it yourself. 
if you are going to do a pre-overclock, be aware that it will more aggressively push the voltage. So you might be shortening your CPU lifespan, and at the very least, you're going to be running a lot hotter than necessary. And that's just because they want to make sure that the overclock applies. They don't want to give you a pre-overclock feature that doesn't work. So that's where that comes from. The next question is from Federico Romero, who says, do you recommend software overclocking apps like Asus 5-Way, Gigabyte, EasyTune, et cetera? They change more than just voltage and multiplier, question mark. Thanks for QA videos, they're helpful. Uh, so overclocking applications, depending on what you're doing, are necessary. Uh, for example, GPU overclocking, you need something like Afterburner or uh, EVGA Precision or something similar to that, Overdrive. Otherwise, you just can't even overclock. So uh, it depends on what you're asking. But for CPU overclocking, I do it all through UEFI. So I prefer to do it through pre-boot environments. And the same thing applies that I just said a second ago. If you do it all through UEFI manually, you're going to get a stable overclock. It takes a bit more time, but it's not going to beat up the CPU as much as some of the more aggressive pre-tuned overclock applications or buttons on motherboards, things like that. But depending on what you're doing, the software is actually pretty good. So some of it, like Afterburner for GPUs, it allows you to set custom fan curves. It allows you to do the frequency overclocking on the core clock, the memory clock, and you can even uh, do some troubleshooting features as well. So all of that's very good, especially the logging utility. And this is something that is actually useful in the CPU overclocking applications as well, is if they have logging options, which some of them do in the settings, then use that, turn it on, and you can see at what point is your voltage or frequency or whatever becoming unstable. At what point is it threatening the stability of the system? So the reason that these applications can exist these days, and they didn't used to exist before, is because of UEFI, and we have a video on this coming out at some point in the future. But UEFI is effectively a replacement for standard BIOS, and it's uh, able to communicate directly with the host. So it's a still a low-level firmware device, but it can communi communicate excuse me, at a higher level with the host, which is your OS. So now your pre-boot environment effectively can communicate with the operating system, and that allows you to pass through overclocks and boot, uh, boot order changes and fan speed changes and things like that from the OS straight to UEFI, uh, which was not possible before with just the basic input-output system that used to exist on firmware before UEFI was developed as a new standard. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, I would still do it through UEFI, though, or BIOS, as you can call it, and uh, except for um, GPUs, because with GPUs, you need some kind of application. Moving on, Daniel Worthy asks, let's see, will an i5-4690K burn out an MSI P33 V2 motherboard? That's not a very high-end motherboard. Uh, it has, like, 2 plus 1 power to the CPU, should I downclock the CPU to try to get the voltage down? Uh, so I, I guess if you're asking this question, I'm, I'm under the assumption that you already own the 4690K. Otherwise, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to buy those two components together. Uh, I, I would get a better motherboard because with this CPU, a 4690K or similar, you're, you're really going to be sort of limiting yourself with low-end motherboards because you're, you're, you're going to have stability issues, that's for sure. Uh, and with the limited power phases, you're certainly not going to have any of the turbo or OC headroom. And you're not going to have OC ability anyway. So I, I would move towards a Z-series higher end motherboard. Strongly encourage that if for no other reason than the power delivery will be cleaner because it'll have more phases. So you'll get more stability. And you really don't want to downclock a good CPU just to fit a, a cheap motherboard. It kind of, if it's possible, if it's within budget, it makes more sense to spend, even at the low end, $85 on a better board, like the uh, PC Mate, I think is about $85, um, and then just work with that instead. So that's, that's kind of where I would go with it. That's a, a very weird combination of components to have a high-end CPU mixed with a cheap motherboard, but I, you can try it. Just be aware that your motherboard will probably exhibit some instability, and you might burn out some of the power components as, as you continue to use the device. Next question is Amir Mahmoud 
He says, hi, Steve. I have a 4790K running at 4.7 gigahertz and 1.3 volts. Would you recommend disabling SVID support? And uh, for those who don't know, SVID, so this is a pretty good question. SVID support is basically on the fly voltage adjustment. So it will allow for more stable overclocks by regulating your voltage actively, which means if you set 1.3 volts in UEFI, but you have SVID on, and maybe the CPU decides it wants 1.325 for an instant in time, then SVID will allow that to change. So you're not sitting at a fixed voltage. Now this allows you to get a couple more X's out of your multiplier. So you might be able to push it a few times higher uh, on the frequency because you've got that SVID regulation to change the voltage on the fly. But generally I would recommend disabling it and then doing more manual tuning. So if you can spend the time to dial it in, it is again going to be a better overclock in the long run, uh, but that does require a bit more time than just a standard overclock with SVID on because now you've got to go in, you have to do a lot more burn-in tests and those take time obviously, and then you have to change the voltage every time it fails to try and find the correct voltage. So. Uh, generally, if you can find a bit of time on a Saturday or something, I would recommend, yeah, turn it off, see what you can achieve. And if it's too much str struggle, if you can't get a stable clock, then just put it back on, no big deal, no big loss. Uh, but you will get a bit more out of your overclock if you disable it. Just kind of depends on what your time investment is there. It's not a terrible feature. It just, again, will sort of aggressively tune the voltage sometimes when it doesn't have to. And uh, that gives you stability, but it it's it kind of threatens uh, the, the CPU in terms of heat and stuff like that as well. So double-edged sword, as with most overclocking features that assist in overclocking. And the final question for this week is from Ryan Zinter, who says, Hey, Steve, love the site and channel. Thank you. My question is this. I've watched tons of videos about overclocking, but I've never been able to achieve a stable overclock. I'm using an AMD 8350 on a 990X motherboard and I'm wanting to upgrade soon, but if I can get more performance out of the chip, I can put off upgrading. Um, and then the question is, where's a good step-by-step -step guide overclocking this chip? Sorry if it sounds noobish. Definitely does not sound noobish. Um, so, of course, we, we do run a lot of guides. I write a couple guides, but I've got to give it up to overclock.net here. So OCN is what they're called. Overclock.net has some of the best overclocking guides I've seen. We don't really go as deep as them because uh, that's more their thing. Overclocking is something that I'm interested in, that the readers are interested in, obviously, but we don't go as hard on the information as they do. So uh, that is something I want to change in the future. It's just a staffing limitation, but I would recommend them. We don't have a guide on the 8350 and probably will not make one at this point. So I'm uh, don't don't wait up for me, basically. but. I can give you some basics here. So first of all, the 990FX board, uh, the 990FX chipset is what you want. 990X, 990FX are both good for overclocking. So you're in a good place there in terms of hardware. 8350 is a pretty good overclocker. I'm not sure what your cooler is, but you'll want to make sure that you have a decent cooler on there, of course, to sustain the thermals that it outputs because the AMD chips do run a bit hotter than some of the Intel chips, the same price competing to Intel chips. Um, and then uh, same sort of thing, you're going to need to look up the uh, guide and then pay attention to the features that they recommend you disable. So I'm not sure off the top of my head what those are going to be for this particular board and CPU, but there's normally features you want to disable like with Intel SVID and stuff like that. And you disable those normally so that there's less power saving going on. So with overclocking, you want to turn off a lot of power saving features. And that's because when you apply the overclock, if the CPU is sitting there fighting you because it thinks there's not enough load for this high frequency, it's going to downclock you and try and save power. So you disable those as recommended, disable the um, live voltage modification by the board or by the low level firmware and stuff like that. And then manually start tuning in, in these cases, especially the base clock and the multipliers, and then you adjust voltage as you find points of instability. But do check OCN. I recommend them quite a bit. There's another one too, uh, Overclockers. So there's overclock.net and then there's Overclockers. Both are good sites. That is where I would start. If you do struggle with this, any of you for that matter, post below and I'll research it myself for next video or the one after that 
and try and give you some input based on what the, the holdup point is. So that is all for episode 10 of Ask GN. As always, thanks a lot for watching and thank you for your great questions. This is a uh, pretty good flow we got going here and it's easy content for us to produce, but really fun to produce. So that is a big plus because it is often the case that I bottleneck the operation these days because I'm working on the, the benchmarks. And speaking of benchmarks, we have a couple coming up, particularly Fallout 4, and then probably Call of Duty Black Ops 3, not 100% positive on that, but I think we will be looking at that. And then Battlefront will be revisited once that's fully out. So that is all for this episode. Check back regularly because the videos are more frequent now. And hit that Patreon link in the post troll video down there if you want to help us out. Big thanks to those of you who have. I will see you all next time.